Lo, your king comes to you. In Zechariah's prophetic words, the king to rejoice over is not the one that comes with a lot of pomp and self-aggrandizement, with heavy-handedness and even violence. In Zechariah's wisdom, the king to rejoice over is the one that comes to us humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, and he shall command peace to the nations. Humble, commanding peace. Well, more than 500 years after Zechariah's vision, an event happened that we now call Palm Sunday. We know the story. Let's hear it now from the Gospel according to Matthew. Listen as God's word continues for all of us this morning. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A whole city in turmoil, people asking each other, who is this? Why are you cutting branches down from the trees and spreading them on the road? Why are you taking your coats and using them to make a welcoming path for this guy who's coming in on a, on a donkey? What is going on here? Who is this? And the people in those very large, excited crowds lining the road from the Mount of Olives down into the valley and up to Jerusalem, they were answering the others, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. For some people on that first Palm Sunday, in that first Palm Sunday crowd, things might have begun to click in their minds. Those who really knew the Hebrew scriptures were beginning to wonder if this Jesus guy might be the long-awaited Messiah, and as they watched the procession, they might suddenly remember the words that David Hill read for us just a moment ago from the prophet Zechariah about a king riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Some in that crowd who knew the Hebrew scriptures well might have watched the scene unfold and thought of the story from the book of 2 Kings of Jehu being declared the next king of Israel. And it says this, Then they hurriedly took all their cloaks and spread them for him on the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. And then there are the Leviticus festival instructions about rejoicing before the Lord with branches of palm trees and boughs of leafy trees. And seeing Jesus come down from the Mount of Olives, some of them might have thought of another passage in Zechariah in which God's great future plan of ultimate reconciliation is predicted to emanate from the Mount of Olives. And of course, some of them in the crowd might begin to surface echoes from Psalm 118 that says, bind the festal procession with branches. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Maybe the most astute observers and quick thinkers would recall all of those scriptures and more as the cloaks were laid and the branches were waved and the colt paraded down the street with Jesus of Nazareth on its back. And I imagine that they reminded each other of these things, helped each other to make the connections. And whether you were steeped in the Hebrew scriptures and had that a tingling feeling that this might really be the long-awaited Messiah, or whether you were totally outside the Jewish tradition but had heard a lot about the miracles and the teachings and the controversy of this person growing in fame. Either way, how exciting to be there and how exciting to engage in the unfolding conversations, the dawning awareness for those present that something meaningful was happening here. Now, not everyone who connected these dots found it to be a joyful thing. In fact, it felt threatening to those in power, those whose missions weren't about peace, those in the halls of power. For them, a jealous rage was brewing. Of course, we know that the festive atmosphere doesn't last. We know how the rest of the week unfolds. We shudder to think of how the reverberations of Hosanna subsided, and that same space was filled with shouts of crucify. But we don't want to get too much ahead of this day, Palm Sunday, the day of the parade. On that day, people were in the presence of Jesus, and they were asking each other, what that meant. People of faith, people seeking faith, have been asking each other about the meaning of Jesus for centuries. Who is this? What does it mean to follow him? What difference does his presence make in our lives? Throughout this season of Lent this year, we have been lifting up significant conversations with Jesus from our scriptures. Conversations over grief, healing, spirituality, theology, worship, struggles of the soul. We've also been blessed to hear stories from those in our midst whose faith has been impacted by memorable conversations. Grace Blazer shared with us of a conversation with a friend during college that strengthened her faith and gave her guidance. Nate Burdick described to us the lessons he learned from a deep dive consideration of the Apostle Paul's conversation with Jesus on the Damascus Road. And last week, Trevor Dane told us about a simple conversation over a cup of coffee that included an invitation to church that changed his life. I want to share about a faith-shaping conversation, faith-shaping for me, that I had with a member of this congregation. It was almost three years ago. You'll recall that at that time we were all in a state of turmoil, although I would call it muted turmoil, lockdown, very little personal interaction, an uncertain future, muted in our usual expressions of faith. And a church member called and said, you know, we're about to get these COVID stimulus checks. He said, but the truth is, I'm doing okay. I'm not financially impacted by the pandemic. I'm sure someone else needs this more than I do. He said, when it arrives, could I give my stimulus money to the church and then the church channel it to someone in need? The sentiment touched my heart and the idea got many of us to thinking Within a week or so, another church member approached us with a very similar question, and a lot of us began to talk about this opportunity and how it might be brought to fruition. And so we did the only thing that hardcore Presbyterians can do in a situation like that. We formed a committee. And with that, I would like to yield some of my time here to bring into the pulpit a current member of that committee, our liturgist for today, David Hill. Our 
Emergency Response Fund is a non-budgeted fund with the purpose of helping congregation members or community members during times of disaster or family emergencies. This fund, formerly called the Pandemic Response Fund, starting in, April, in May of 2020, is solely funded by donations from the congregation. Hundreds of individuals and families have been helped since its inception in 2020, and it is a vital mission of this church that needs to continue. I'm speaking today in support of this mission because this fund is at a low point right now. The ERF committee currently has four members, Chairperson Michael Zoller, C. Cochran, Alex Bryce, and myself, with Pastor Georgia as our staff resource member. Referrals from several organizations in the community or individual requests for help are handled by our church secretary who forwards the initial information to Pastor Georgia, who then contacts a commi committee member to help verify information and work with families or individuals. Most of the emergency requests are for things like gas cards or a month's utility payment to avoid having their power shut off. If all information is verified, the church then makes the requested payment to the utility company or provides the needed gas cards or other items. These requests are usually from people who have lost a job, have had illness or injury preventing them from working, or in some way have limited income for a short period of time. One of our important partners, Oasis, refers women struggling to become sober but need some short-term help. These women are trying hard to develop a healthy lifestyle so they can eventually support themselves. Our church has helped several of these women recently. We as a church family are mostly comfortable. We don't always realize that there are people out there struggling every day and just need some short-term help to get back on their feet. We occasionally hear from someone that we have assisted that calls to say thank you for helping me when I needed it the most. The members of this congregation have generously supported this mission with one-time donations or small monthly contributions over the last several years. Our fund is getting low, so if you feel inclined to help others in need, please consider a contribution to this important effort of our church. You can donate by indicating ERF on your check or give online by choosing Emergency Response Fund on the drop-down giving menu. Thank you for caring for others in their time of need. Thank you, David, and thank you to those on the Emergency Response Fund Committee who work so diligently. What a blessing it is to be able to enact this ministry on a weekly and sometimes even daily basis and to hear the echoes of Jesus' words when he said, when you help these, you are helping me. And over the years, we have ministered this way in Jesus' name over the last three years, distributing help where it is most needed in our church family and in our community, now approaching over $100,000 worth of assistance in unbudgeted, above and beyond giving. That just shows the generosity of this congregation and the impact it has had on this community to help people through hard times. And it began with a conversation. The disciples who were untying that donkey must have had some tentative conversations with each other. What are we doing? Will this further the purposes of God's kingdom? This seems small, this seems insignificant, just untying some animals and bringing them to Jesus. What will be gained by this? We often have that feeling that what we do is small and we don't see how it fits into the larger picture. Jesus gave them this strange behind the scenes task and they just had to go on in faith and trust that his instructions were going to serve a higher purpose. And so it is for us, so often, we summon the courage to step out in faith. That church member who called me three years ago might have 
debated before making that phone call, wondering if it was the right thing to do. But look at the movement that was started by that. Well, we have one more reflection on the importance of conversations in our faith journey. Reverend Chuck Miller is a retired pastor who, along with his wife Lori, have blessed our congregation with their fellowship, their food pantry volunteering, and their worshiping presence. So Chuck, I invite you now to step into the pulpit and share your reflection with us. It was Augustine, maybe you call him Augustine, one of the great theologians of the church who centuries ago wrote, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in thee. I didn't realize my heart was restless until one Sunday morning, 52 years ago, when I walked into the congregation, the sanctuary of the Village Presbyterian Church in Prairie Village, Kansas, which is a suburb of Kansas City. My wife Lori and I were there that Sunday morning because we were looking for a church home after I had been discharged from the military and our subsequent relocation so I could begin a new job. Well, up to that point in my life, my involvement in a church or attendance and worship had been, you'd have to say, sporadic at least, at the best. But now I was ready to be this responsible husband and father of a three-year-old son. So I committed to a church where we could worship God and where we could be nurtured in the faith. Well, from that first Sunday morning when the choir music, the organ music, choked me up emotionally, filling my heart and bringing tears to my eyes when the pastor boldly preached the gospel. And when he, from his heart, on behalf of the congregation, prayed, I thought I was eavesdropping on his private conversation with God and I knew at that moment, I was home. I was home. I realized then that there was something missing in my life. There was something my soul longed for. I realized there was this God-shaped space in, within me, and only God could fill it. The village church at that time was a congregation of almost 7,000 members. It had a choir of almost 200 members. A third of them, roughly, would divide up so they'd each sing at one of the three Sunday services. And they had a gifted staff. Me, I was like a, a dry sponge. I was soaking up that living water that you heard about a couple of Sundays ago Jesus at the well with the woman from Samaria. And I experienced a spring of water that Jesus described that was welling up inside of me because of the stirrings of the Spirit deep within my heart and soul. And for the two and a half years we were part of that congregation, what the church had to offer and what opportunities lay outside of the church. Those amounted to what the psalmist describes as a feast for my soul. God drew me closer. Our relationship ever deepening. And there were so many positive transforming influences on my faith at that time. But it was during that time that I first experienced what I will call a covenant group. Imagine yourself part of a group of not more than 10 to 12 people, K 
kindred spirits on the journey of faith with you who commit to meeting regularly for a specific number of weeks, maybe even months. Do you agree that what is said in the group stays in the group? And that everyone will respect the feelings, the experiences, and the beliefs of the other members. In other words, a, a welcoming, accepting environment, right? A safe place where folks can share what they perceive as encounters with the living God, where they can learn from the experiences and insights and aha moments of others as they share their own unique faith stories. And yes, where everyone can share their struggles, their questions, and their doubts. When it comes to understanding the mystery that we call God, God's will and God's ways, we as scripture attest, see what? In a mirror dimly, it says. For we walk by faith, not by sight. That, I believe, is why we need and God intends for us to have other seekers on the journey with us. For there are times we need help. We need help to see the path that we're supposed to take in following the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, right? And imagine receiving all the support and encouragement that we can offer one another as we deal with the changes and challenges of daily living. Imagine sharing the journey of faith with companions on the way who, with God's help, seek to discern where God is at work in our lives and what God might be saying to us along the way. All of that at its best is why I am so grateful for the covenant groups that have shaped my faith and enriched my life. And I thank you for this opportunity to share a part of my faith story. Thank you, Chuck. Companions on the way. Followers of Jesus Christ. People in the crowd asking questions of faith, discerning the presence of Jesus, discerning what it means to serve Jesus. We are so blessed to be able to do this together in our family of faith. We lift each other up. We prop each other up when we are weary or doubting. Our conversations can strengthen each other when we are tempted to turn away. Our conversations can draw us back with grace when we have turned away. We cheer each other on when we take risks. We listen to each other's ideas and we add our own energy to them. And we pray for each other. Friends, I encourage all of us to engage, to engage ever more deeply in conversations with Jesus, to engage ever more deeply in the life of faith in the church family. Through prayer, scripture, and fellowship, there are so many venues, all of them rich with conversation. We have the Wednesday We Care group. We have conversations that matter, dinners. Sunday school, Presbyterian women Bible studies, coffee after worship, the new men's fellowship that is starting up in a few weeks. Take note in the April newsletter for that. Camaraderie among food pantry volunteers, the choir, and yes, even in committees. There is fellowship and spirituality. There are countless opportunities for us to process our faith together, to grow in faith together. Who is this? The crowds asked. And others answered, and they talked about it. May we become strong in our faith together as we continue the conversation, as we move through the challenges of this week that is called holy, and to the glory of Easter and beyond. Thanks be to God for this church family. Amen. <laughs>